Mr. Mark, you are live on the air. Go ahead with your question. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks for hearing me. I, I wanted to ask um, about dualism a little bit more. Um, I'm burdened by the scripture in the New Testament that says, love not the world or anything of the world or the love of the Father is not in you. That led me on to a, a path of Gnosticism. I'm sure you've heard of Gnosticism and all of its things. And that goes back to the Garden of Eden. And so, uh, can you maybe help enlighten me on where maybe some of this comes from and the purpose of the serpent? Because if, you know, Hashem, it says, you know, Hero Israel, our God is one, our Lord is one. So I understand that there has to be one originating entity. And it's just one, it all exists as one. But what was the purpose of the, the serpent, if there was a purpose? So those are really two different subjects. Gnosticism which is very important when understanding what fueled New Testament writers. Gnosticism is a dualism because at that time, dualism infected everything, infected almost every religion, not only the Levant but well beyond. Gnosticism is always pagan, always. All Gnostics are pagans. But essentially, Gnosticism viewed this world as an evil place. This whole world is just evil, bad. And it's easy to understand why this made sense. If modern medicine didn't exist, would you, would you and the people you love be alive today? Maybe not, right? It was, the world was a place of inexplicable suffering. It made no sense. Conversely, when you looked up at the sky, the night sky, in the ancient world, people really had a better understanding of the, the celestial movements, and everything was perfect. Imagine how different this is. The celestial world, you could predict where all the stars would be at a certain time of the year. And around you, nothing was explicable. Broken bodies and broken wheels and... There was no reason. A man married, marries a nice, beautiful, healthy girl, and three months later, she's dead. I don't know what the heck happened to her. They didn't know. They didn't understand any of this. It was just, you know, if you read biographies of people, whether it's people who lived relatively recently, even, let's say, in the time of Mozart. I remember reading the biography. He says, I, I don't remember. I think his mother had, I don't know how many children he, his mother had. Was it five, six, seven, whatever? She had a bunch of kids, but only a few of them made it to adulthood. I don't know, two or three. And that was normal. Death was ubiquitous, okay? So in the ancient world, this world was a bad place. This is the Manichaeism of Augustine. He, and the cele this world is a place to just get away from, to escape. How can I get away from this? How can I be in the celestial part of a celestial world that's perfect? This world is real Neoplatonic thinking. This world was created by a god, but a lower tier god, a, a demiurge. Because look at it, it's a nightmare. The lord of this world is the devil. It's something, and the whole purpose is to get away from it. That's why celibacy or things like celibacy prevailed so much, you know. Like, you know, Augustine thought that if you get married, you want to have children, of course, you sleep with your spouse. But once you're done having children, there's no reason to be intimate with your, with your spouse. He saw that all as lower. In the thinking of the Orthodox Church is that and among many different Christian sects, is that when Mary was born, her parents, now according to all Christian denominations, Mary was not supernaturally conceived, like to a virgin, any, none of that. Um, but uh, it is widely viewed in the Orthodox Church that they had no pleasure that means Mary's mother, Anna, had no pleasure at all 
in having sex with a husband when Mary was conceived. The Catholic Church goes on to, to teach the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, which is not a virgin birth. It means that she was born without the stain of original sin. I don't want to go off topic, but you understand that kind of view is all entangled together. And the key in Gnosticism, this develops very strong in the second century, is if you're on a world that's a bad place that was created by a god but a lower god, how do you escape? How do you get to the good place, right? So you had to have information, knowledge. You had to have the to untangle the mystery of this world so you can escape it. And this Paul talks about this openly. Read Ephesians chapter 3. And Paul openly says that this, everything in this world is a big secret, and he has that revelation. And he says that if the leaders of the generation of Jesus would have only known the secrets of this, these secrets, that's what gnosis means. It means knowledge. What does knowledge have to do with anything? It means this world's a horrible place, a sinful place, a corrupt place, just a filthy place. But how do you, what's your ticket to heaven? That you have the secret knowledge that only Paul provides. That's why this word mystery is all over Paul's letters. Ah, missionaries claim it's open in Isaiah 53, it's open in the Daniel line. Paul didn't care about any of that. He said there's a big mystery and no one knew it. There are, mamish, there are missionaries who claim that the whole Christian salvation program was a complete mystery. Nobody knew it but Paul. Paul makes that claim. These missionaries are not—this is all in that dark theological jungle. It's all interconnected. Okay, you got all that? So— Gnosis means knowledge was your ticket to escape the, this world by knowing who you are, where you come from, and how to get out of here. You have to have the secret knowledge. And Paul is claiming in his letters he has that secret knowledge, and he got it directly from Jesus Christ. He did not have to rely on Jerusalem for it. This is all over Paul's letters. That's why when we see where the book of Acts deviates from Paul's letters— it is there are a number of reasons or there are a number of deviations between Paul's letters and the book of Acts. The the most striking one is how frequently did Paul visit Jerusalem? In Acts, he was going back and forth and bring sacrifices and circumcising Timothy. Paul eh, spent a couple of weeks, you said, in the beginning of Galatians. And you know, he met the disciples, the so-called pillars of the church. You understand? It's a mystery. That's what's important. So that's where, that's where this term mystery religion comes from. The occult, what does that mean? Those things that are hidden. What does it mean hidden? That's what's going on. Now, you're talking about the serpent in the Garden of Eden. It's not connected to Gnosticism. I'll just give you something very quickly. So in order to understand the serpent in the Garden of Eden, which is we're introduced to the Nochosh in Genesis 3, verse 1, it seems inexplicable of what is the motive of this character. The serpent is trying to persuade Eve to eat from the tree of knowledge, but it's not a Gnostic thing at all. Very simple. The serpent was unique in the world in that we're told in the Torah that it was very wise. It was the most, uh, of all the beasts in the field, it was the most wise. It had, it can walk, it had legs. It could talk. Walk, talk, and intelligent, what does that make you think of? And it was a connoisseur of good food, which it lost when it was cursed. It, the the nachosh, it's a beast, seems almost human. But why, why is this character there? I know people say it's Satan, it's the devil, but we need to get more sophisticated. So I'm just going to give you the one-minute version of this, and that is that Adam— Right before this in chapter 2, 
was shown all the beasts in the field to see which one was a possible soulmate for a wife. Adam saw that there's no animal that was appropriate for him. And he was felt bad, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave him a wife, right? Which Of which animals would have felt, boy, he really dumped me. It would have been the walking, talking, thinking, fine-tasting creature that's almost human. And the argument the Nachash is making, the serpent is making is, this is not how it says, but I'm just paraphrasing what's happening there. The serpent would seem to be almost human, have the qualities that a human being would have, sentient, not just as an animal, almost as a human being. In other words, saying the way we operate in the animal kingdom is we do not listen to the voice of God. We operate by instincts. Unfortunately, Chava listened to him and followed instincts. Remember, she saw the fruit. She saw it was, it was tasty and so on. But getting back, the Gnosticism is all over the place, in, especially in Paul's letters. It's really everywhere, but it's just very strong in Paul's letters because that's, after all, where Christian theology is found, in the letters of Paul rather than the Gospels. Thank you for your question. If you enjoy this program, please like and subscribe. Adon Olah, Asher Malach, Beterem Kol, Yetzir Nivra, Let Nasa, Bechef Tzokor.